welcome to a special edition of the Lions Den. Today we are discussing the state of the HBCU Florida edition. I am Professor Jefferson Noel, your host for the evening, and I am delighted to share this moment with incredible, powerful men who are leading transformational efforts to educate and empower HBCU students in the great state of Florida. We have the presidents of all of the HBCUs in Florida here to discuss funding, alumni giving, and the future of HBCUs. Thank you to all of our viewers who are watching on Facebook and YouTube around the world. We encourage you to share this video with all of your friends and family. Before we bring the presidents on, we have a special video for you. Come find your place in it. Bethune-Cookman University. We are Edward Water University! And I'm so proud of you for what you're doing at our university because our institution is literally about to go to the next level. We hope you enjoyed that taste of our HBCUs in Florida, and we will have the presidents of those institutions on right after this video. I am honored to bring to the virtual stage President Faison of Edward Waters University, President Powell of Bethune-Cookman University, President Robinson of Florida A&M University, and our very own President Hardrick of Florida Memorial University. President Hardrick. Thank you, Professor Noel. Uh, let me first of all say good evening to our audience uh, and good evening to my fellow presidents. Thank you all so much for joining us uh, in this conversation this evening. To one, apprise our uh, audience and so many others of the wonderful things that are taking place at our uh, historic and our great universities. Uh, but before we get started, let me take a moment of privilege to say happy belated birthday to President Robinson, who uh, celebrated his birthday this past Monday. In fact, that was what, yesterday. So. Happy birthday, President Robinson. We really do appreciate you, brother. Um, as we get started, uh, I, we just closed out a new, uh, another calendar year. And what I would like to do at this moment is just, we know that we've accomplished a lot of good things at our universities and, and we've done it during a very challenging time. So I would like each one of the presidents, if you don't mind, just take a moment uh, to really give us, if you will, about five notable achievements that you guys were able to accomplish during this calendar year. We realize we have the second half of our academic year to go, uh, but I would just like for you to take literally just a, a couple of minutes to really brag on some of the great achievements that you were you witnessed and that you guys uh, at your institutions were able to accomplish during this past calendar year. We'll start with you, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, President Robinson, since uh, it's your birthday. <laughs> well, well, thank you. Um, 
uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to participate in this program. And, um, I hope I can add uh, something of substance to the conversation, but I, but I do think it's commendable that you allow me to share some time with these fellow leaders, uh, which I feel very, very fond of. Um, it's great to be in your company. So this, this past year um, was a, a record year in a number of ways for Florida a &M University. Let me just start with the fact that, you know, we received uh, first a record number of students applying for admissions uh, to Florida a &M University. And uh, we are on that course again for the 2022 fall year as well. But perhaps more importantly uh, is, is the fact that, you know, we've seen a significant uh, increase in our four-year graduation rate, um, significant increase in our freshman and sophomore retention rate or progress rate, as it's called by the Board of Governors for students who have, who are coming back to us with at least a 2.0 GPA and above. And by the way, for the current uh, students who have been admitted to the university for the fall of 2022, the average uh, high school GPA is, is 4.0. We also had a, a record year in uh, research dollars uh, garnered by our outstanding faculty, staff, and students at the university. Um, and it's been a record for each of the last two years, 60 million a couple of years ago, and uh, 66 million in the most recent year. And then of course, we, we had something I'm really, really proud of is that we had a record year in fundraising for the university. And, and for your information, we've already exceeded that amount significantly uh, just um, into the first six months of this you know, fiscal year, which started on, on July the 1st. So we got a lot of great things, as we like to say, at FAMU that, that are happening every day. But then I think the, the other story, too, is, is what our graduates are doing in, out in the world. And, um, you know, I had the opportunity on the 2nd of January to uh, visit the balmy St. Paul, Minnesota, where one of our graduates, uh, Melvin Carter, was inaugurated or sworn in for his second time, second term as mayor of that city. Uh, I missed the first one uh, in 2017 because I uh, thought it wise to go to the inauguration for Keisha Lance Bottoms, who was being sworn in as mayor of the city of Atlanta. And then furthermore, although I did make it, uh, last week we saw the first time African-American mayor, a family graduate, uh, sworn in as the mayor of St. Pete, Florida, Ken Welch. Both of these mayors, by the way, are graduates of our, you know, our renowned, uh, School of Business and Industry. And so from, from St. Pete to St. Paul, right? Uh, and the writers are at the ham. And I'm really proud of these gentlemen because they exemplify uh, what we're really about. They could have done and have been doing quite well in their careers professionally, but they wanted to give back uh, to the larger communities. And so that's extremely commendable, but it's also important for us to sustain you know, these institutions and our graduates are out there having impact in the communities from which they came. So that's just a few highlights of, of this previous year. There, there are so many more. Hopefully I'll get to share it with you later. Thank you, President Robinson. Appreciate it. So President Faison, why do you talk with us and share with us some of the great things you guys were able to accomplish? And uh, if we can just keep it uh, uh, simply because of the time, keep it to uh, uh, a minimum amount. I would appreciate it, man. And you guys have done some wonderful things, brother. Very proud of you. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Hardrick. And certainly uh, want to just say hello to all of my colleagues here uh, that have joined us here this evening. Um, it, this year really has been marked by tremendous historic transformation for Edward Waters. Um, of course, uh, we moved from Edward Waters College to now Edward Waters University uh, after 155 years as Edward Waters College. And we're excited to uh, make that transition this past summer uh, per the approval of our accrediting body, SAC COC. Simultaneous to that, we also uh, came through our fifth year interim 
review, uh, accreditation review uh, from SAC COC with flying colors. Uh, no follow-ups, no monitoring reports, um, a clean bill of health, if you will, um, that reauthorizes or reaffirms our accreditation through 2025. We're very excited about that as well. Um, we uh, experienced a record enrollment this year. Edward Waters enrollment um, has increased by 19.1% through the pandemic since 2019. It really makes us the fastest growing HBCU in our state over the past two or three years, and also the fastest growing uh, college or university here in our city here in Jacksonville. So we're very excited about that. Welcomed in the highest number um, of new students uh, in the history of the institution, over 500 new students joined our institution this year. So just phenomenal enrollment growth on the whole. Our retention uh, year over year was almost 80% this year. Uh, that's a new a new high mark for us. And so we're just very excited about our overall growth. We also brought on two new academic programs here um, pursuant to our moving to university status. We brought on our first graduate degree program in the 155 year history of our institution, uh, the master's degree in business administration, which is 100% online. Uh, and then right before we broke for the break, um, we were notified by SAC COC of the approval um, for a new undergraduate degree program in forensic science. Uh, so we're very excited about both of those two uh, new programs that have come on just in the past year. And lastly, uh, we moved also uh, from the NAIA uh, to the NCAA at the Division II level this past year. Uh, for the first time in our history, we had never, never uh, been members of the NCAA. Uh, and so we're very excited about that transition. It has brought a really heightened sense of energy to our athletic program. Um, as a matter of fact, we'll be attending our first NCAA uh, convention on, on, on next week. So we're very excited about uh, the growth that we're experiencing in our athletic program. We have now joined the SIAC conference, uh, which is a venerable historically black conference. And we're very excited about that and to be now competing uh, as the state of Florida's only HBCU competing at the NCAA Division II level. Uh, and the only thing that I'll add as well is that we've completed almost $10 million in capital infrastructure improvements over the past year. Um, we had the renovation of our largest student residence facility about 10 months ago, a uh, multi-million dollar uh, renovation of, uh, of that facility. And then lastly, uh, the multi-million dollar uh, grant opening of our first on-campus stadium here at Edward Water. So really, again, just a transformative year and much that we are excited about here, excited about here at Edward Waters University. Thank you, President Faison. President Powell. Good afternoon, everyone. It is certainly a pleasure to be joining my esteemed colleagues and uh, to hear some of the impressive things that are taking place at your universities. Uh, at Bethune-Cookman, probably the biggest thing that I'd like to share is the fact that um, Bethune-Cookman uh, was able to restructure in what is called the deal of the century, a bad debt from 306 million down to 108 million. Uh, it was a phenomenal uh, task by a team of lawyers and financial professionals to be able to reposition the university uh, and its finances and its ability to look to the future with an aggression uh, by having that debt taken from out over our heads. Uh, secondly, Bethune-Cookman has been blessed in the fact that our founder has been selected to go into Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C., Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune. Uh, that is extremely important to us because it created a professional uh, profile on the national scale and, quite frankly, on the international scale that moves us forward. With regard to enrollment, we were pleased this uh, fall to uh, have a 200 additional freshmen to our freshman class than what we normally would have in, in the coming years. Uh, the retention rate for those freshmen and the year-to-year the -year progression of students from freshman to sophomore is up in about the 85% range. Uh, we expect that even in spite of COVID and its challenges for that uh, trend to continue. Also want to talk about the um, uh, this term. I know many of you have already done it, but Thune-Cookman will pay off 
close to $15 million, $15 million in student loan debt. Um, I know many of you have done that same. It is certainly a game changer. It allows students who otherwise may not be able to continue uh, their matriculation to be able to do so and to do so actually at a place that sort of resets the button for them and allow them to continue to move forward. We also were pleased to, uh, we have not changed or raised the GPA at Bethune-Cookman, but the recruitment process has yielded us an average GPA of about 3.2, uh, even though our standard GPA to make sure we continue to allow access still remains uh, at 2.8. Uh, those students still continue to go out and perform well and to create the university in a very uh, exciting and good light. Also on the rise, the Bethune Cookman has been very fortunate and strategically been focused on partnerships uh, with internal, with external uh, industries. Uh, we have adopted the concept that really there's no separation between industry and education anymore, that the two of those are partners. And so we've partnered with quite a few new partners, uh, including Disney, even though we've been partnered with them prior in our hospitality management program. We now partnered with them in other ways. We also were able to partner with the Propel Center, uh, uh, which is a new venture that's uh, funded by Ed Farm and Apple uh, that will be built, a facility will be built in Atlanta. And we are among the first to sign on and have recently been awarded a uh, 300,000 grant to create music mongos through our recording technology program in the upcoming year. Uh, we also are very fortunate that we, we have positioned ourselves in our hiring process to hire strategic hires, particularly in our Dean's position, in our E-suite positions. And so we have managed to really uh, secure some really top shelf faculty uh, and top shelf administrators that are restructuring our, our programs, particularly with an eye towards what the future of education will look like, what kind of opportunities will be available to our students five years from now, 10 years from now, and making sure that we adjust our programs accordingly. We're in the midst of an academic prioritization process, which will streamline and again, again, focus our programs and our efforts in our finances so that we're able to make sure that our students are preparing for the world of tomorrow, along as we continue some of those traditional pieces as we move forward. Um, I'm particularly proud for some of the hires in our athletic program. As many of you probably know by now, we hired uh, athletic director and coach, and I apologize to, to Dr. Robinson, who said we uh, are <laughs> uh, slave trading the guy by having him in two jobs, but uh, he seems to be handling them both well and uh, uh, is, is, is making inroads into possible futures. Uh, there is a possible arena for our future that is coming up and has been designed, and you should probably see some of that in the near future. Thank you. Brother, uh, brother, I, I, I know you want to come back. I know you want to come back at Brother Powell, but uh, uh, perhaps you can get him on the next round. <laughs> well, gentlemen, it, it just, I, I, I'm always um, grateful and uh, excited to hear a lot of the wonderful things that you guys are, have been able to accomplish. And I can tell you here at Florida Memorial, we've experienced that same level of success where we, we literally this past fall uh, enroll one of the highest freshman classes in the past five years, uh, fully automated, all of our enrollment where uh, literally when I came on board in 2018, we were doing it one piece of paper at a time. Uh, students can now do everything on their mobile devices. Um, also excited uh, about the fact that our entire campus is now wireless uh, as a result of a partnership with Cisco Systems we launched about 14 certificate type programs all for the community to help members of the community to develop uh, uh, workforce skills and uh, to really make them marketable. And all these programs were underwritten and paid by, uh, again, corporate partners as well as uh, private philanthropists, uh, which doesn't cost uh, the participants anything other than time. And, and so I'm so grateful for partnerships with uh, again, like the Miami Dolphin, Miami Heat, Lennar, and so many others who are pulling up to the table 
to really support our university. And then just, just being able to, uh, again, many new academic programs, new athletic programs we were able to bring on uh, that really uh, contributed to the great success uh, throughout the university, we've renovated, and particularly my my own facility people have renovated so many different areas here uh, at the university. Just a gorgeous campus, and I'm just grateful to our faculty and our staff and everybody who's committed to the high retention rate of our students and and just the good work that has taken place. And and I'm so excited that after a 62 year hiatus we were able to really complete a full year of football this time around. And in fact, we broke in the stadium with Edward Waters uh, for our first game. Uh, it was just absolutely exciting to be there. Although Edward Waters uh, beat us out by, I think, a couple of points, but we're coming back for you, brother. Just want you to know. And uh, for a band that, I, again, I started a band at the university. And after one year, I'm, I'm truly honored that uh, ESPN ranked our band as the number one HBCU band uh, in Division II. So there's so many wonderful things that we're accomplishing at our institutions. And I really think that our, our universities are showing the level of significance that we are continuing to graduate top talented students who are going into the, to the, the global communities and taking on leadership roles that are really making a difference in our society. So uh, kudos to all of you brothers for doing an awesome job. Uh, let me let me transition. And I know we talk about a lot of this a lot of time, particularly as it relates to, uh, if you will, the, 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 the federal funding that uh, some of our institutions receive. Uh, and now we have the Build Back Better um, uh, that we're hoping passes uh, Congress and and that will bring needed resources to um, our institutions to really continue to enhance um, the infrastructures and ailing, um, uh, if you will, buildings and what have you. So, uh, but at the same time, we also are still dealing with this mindset of some that HBCUs are receiving too much money. Right. And I would be interested in hearing your thoughts, one, about uh, your feedback about that notion that our universities receive more than our share of funding through CARES and and HERF and what have you to be able to help our students be able to cross the finish line. And then hear your, your thoughts around whether or not you think, again, the Build Back Better is going to make it through Congress and what would that do? for your institutions. Let's start with you, uh, with you, uh, President Faison. You're, you're on mute. President Faison, you're on mute. Thank you, Mr. President. You know, one of the most prodigious needs on my campus is an aging infrastructure. You know, we are 155 years old. I'll give you an example. Um, we have not had new construction of a new residence facility uh, since 1982. Um, and so that's a prodigious need for us. So the Build Back Better plan would help us because it specifically targets aging infrastructure. We have almost $100 million of deferred maintenance uh, uh, needs on our campus, which is not unique, of course, to Edward Waters. I'm sure many of you all uh, can share the same sentiment. And so it's a priority for us to be able to begin um, our work to improve the conditions on our campus, you know, our, our, our classrooms, our residence facilities. Um, it, it, it certainly is a priority. And, you know, we're making some progress in that regard. As I mentioned earlier, uh, about 10 months ago, less than a year ago now, um, we were able to do some work on our larger student residence facility. Um, we're getting ready to open a new student activity center, hopefully within the next 30 days or so. So this Build Back Better plan is just essentially important for us. And I'll, I'll mention this briefly as well. You know, I know that you, you asked about the, the, the notion about all the COVID dollars that have come to our institutions, and they certainly have been instrumental in helping to support uh, the work that we do at our institutions. But those funds are restricted. And sometimes there's a misnomer that, well, you've heard these institutions have gotten all this money and that they can just use those for whatever it is that they see fit in terms of capital projects and that kind of thing. 
And so we know that those dollars, you know, can't necessarily be used in that way, although they're very much so needed and, and, and we are very grateful to have them. Um, they're not just unrestricted for all kinds of use as much as we would like to have them to do some other things on our campuses. So, you know, I'm a strong advocate for the Build Back Better plan, and I'm very, very hopeful uh, that Congress will be able to push that through such that uh, at least on my campus, we can really begin to do the work that we need to do to improve our infrastructure and our living and learning conditions for our students. Thank you, Brother President. President Powell. Well, I, th I think you said it exquisitely, and I think all of us probably will repeat the same thing. The, the biggest issue on any campus of an HBCU is deferred maintenance. Uh, we not quite at 100 million. We're about we've identified about 80 million dollars worth. Uh, fortunately, we were able to address about 8 million of that uh, this fall, which sort of pushes us forward. But what I'm concerned about mostly, as we think about these plans, it's what you have to realize. Everybody's concerned about the tension we're getting because we've got none in the past virtually. So the idea now that there is some effort to really focus on HBCUs, and of course, that's not just happening with federal, that's also happening in the private sec sector as well. Correct. And so, and part of it is being pushed and, and really focused because of the whole DEI movement and the ability now to say, hey, everybody matters, you know, HBCUs as well as, as the PWIs. So again, I think uh, we've been fortunate at Bethune-Cookman that particularly our technology infrastructure, it has been a priority and a focus for a lot of years, probably at least for about 30 years. So we've been, we've been in pretty good shape when it comes to technology infrastructure, a lot of stuff that people are just getting, we've had for, for long periods of time, uh, you know, fiber network uh, and, 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 and uh, you know, the you know smart classroom just about in every classroom on campus are uh, some of the best technology and and it had to do with really with the vision of our CIO and certainly our academic leadership so I think the build back better dollars really I don't want to use the word entitlement but it really is now being I won't even say fair play but being getting to acknowledge and when you think about what the HBCUs have been able to produce with the limited resources and investments that they've made in our society, as you pointed out, uh, our President Jaffers, that it is it really is time now to say that all of these institutions matter. Uh, you heard Dr. Uh, and and sort and certainly our FAMU is known for its research and business and 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 you know and what it what we have come to realize is those investments in us are not a special aside. Because when you look at what our graduates go out in society and do, it becomes incredible what we be able to do with what we have. So I think what the Build Back Better does is position all of our universities to be greater contributors to society. President Robinson, any any anything differently you want to you want well, to add? Because I think yeah. these guys uh, yeah, they been spot on. They've done an excellent job, but I do want to begin by, you know, thanking those folks in DC who, who yeah. saw it appropriate to do what they have done, right? And because they realized that the need was greater at our institutions. It is not a balanced playing field, right? And and here we here we are talking about HBCUs getting more money. That's that's almost ridiculous, right? In fact, it is. Uh, ridiculous, uh, just to put it in blunt terms, you know, but there are people in D.C. who have seen and understand the fact that as a nation, right, a collective of collection of academic institutions, you know, they need to all be running on all cylinders, right, because we're in a battle not between publics and privates and Ivy Leagues and HBCUs. We're in a battle with other nations, right. and consortiums of nations who don't necessarily have our best interest in mind. They're trying to develop technologies that are faster than us, solutions to healthcare faster than us. And we can't afford to assume in America anymore that we can beat these conglomerations with just folks from the suburbs, or just part of our educational system. We have to be wise enough to invest where really the biggest bang on the buck is. The return on investment in HBCUs is tremendous. Look at what we have done with the resources that we received throughout our history. And can you imagine where we would be as a society had we 
funded HBCUs more equi equitably throughout our history. We have been a better place as a nation. But let me just tell you, um, you know, this infrastructure issue, I mean, it sort of starts with the, the notion that build it and they would come. But for us, it's, you know, build it, you know, and it will allow us, you know, to give back more uh, to our communities, to this state and, and to this nation. You know, we're really proud that, you know, we've had some infrastructure enhancements this past year. In fact, this time a year ago, we opened up, you know, a $45 million facility on our campus funded with state dollars that allows us, allowed us for the first time in our history to consolidate our student services in the, to one place, right? I mean, we're probably one of the few, if not the only, uh, public institution that's part of the state university system that's just now getting around to that, right? And so the people who think we're getting something we don't deserve, I, I just don't understand if they understand what the bigger issues are and what the real challenges that we have as a state and as a nation. So, so let me, uh, keeping, keeping in that same vein, if you don't mind, uh, and, and, and I don't know if it happened to you guys directly, but this past week, uh, I know Florida Memorial was one of those universities where, uh, uh, again, uh, ar around the nation, several of our uh, institutions were basically having to make some serious adjustments due to uh, bond threats. And what's so weird about all of this, um, it was a uh, police department in Orlando that contacted the police department in Miami Gardens who contacted uh, my director of campus safety. Uh, and then I was dealing with this. And then unbeknownst to me, while um, at a conference, several of my other fellow presidents were dealing with the same issues. And it, it went on for a couple of days or so. So I, I am curious to know if um, you guys had to deal with something of that nature. And what do you, what do you think is really precipitating um, these type of attacks on our institutions? Uh, because one, I can tell you, it's extremely disruptive uh, when you're having to quickly adjust and deal with this type of uh, nonsense that we, we are seeing and that what we witnessed last week. And then you got the cybersecurity issues that are certainly taking place as well. I just think that's a, it, it, it's a lot. And I'm just wondering, do you think that is intentional or, or do you think it's just truly a hoax or whatever it may be? But I know now the FBI and many others, agencies, if you will, are weighing in trying to better understand what, what is really happening here. So I'm curious to hear your opinions. Well, if, if I might, you know, since we've had, you know, fact, in fact, throughout our history, right, we've had these kinds of threats on our campuses because, you know, we I weren't, agree. you know, the education wasn't designed for us originally, right? And so to, to have the, the goal to try to educate um, African-Americans in, in this part of the world was quite a challenge and it wasn't met uh, fondly anywhere. At Florida M University, you know, we we actually had more than a bomb threat back in Dr. Humphrey's tenure while I was here. Um, we actually had bombs placed, you know, uh, on our campus. One went off, not nobody was hurt. But when you move to the motivation today, I don't think it's any different. It's just that that when you get a bomb threat today, you cannot afford. Uh, to take it lightly. You can't assume that it's not serious. And so it's disruptive and it's a form of terrorism. That's all that it is. That's all it has ever been. But it's not foreign to us, you know, at our campuses, certainly not to Florida a m University. Can't afford to take these things lightly. We didn't have a direct threat to FAMU, but one of our local schools, um, you know, with, within a couple of miles of the campus received some type of threat. I don't know if it led to them shutting it down. You know, we had a conversation with our safety folks about were there any precautions um, that we needed to take. These are serious matters. It disrupts the lives of our institutions, our students, and everybody else. And it's driven by hate and ignorance, yeah. right? And that's all I can say about that. Yeah. President Powell, any comments? Yes, I, you know, I, there are two things. Uh, one, I, and I want to just give 
historical context in the sense that Dr. Robson just finished doing. And, you know, back in Dr. Bethune's days when she was president of the university, uh, the Ku Klux Klan actually came to burn down Bethune Cookman University, Bethune Cookman College at the time. And so it's not brand new. Uh, I think the historical context that President Robinson gave is right on, on point. If you read the, the history, uh, the printed history and documented history, you will will see instances of that uh, repeatedly. Uh, the other part of that, I think, is is that we have issued, we have uh, entered a phase of our lives where social ills are increasing dramatically, and where there is this sense of lawlessness and the sense of empowerment. Uh, through law, lawlessness. And I think part of that, as you've seen, because I mean, it's on our campus, but you go back and look at the shootings on the high school campuses. Uh, right down the street from us, we have Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. And uh, they received, they had a guy, they caught a guy. And, and it's important that we do inform our students that if you see something, say something. Because uh, one of the it wasn't a student at the university, but someone who had threatened online that they were going to come in and they were going to just shoot people at that university, which is right down the street from us. And the students were smart enough that they said something and they were able to thwart it by catching the young man. But he was fully loaded. I mean, assault rifles, ammunition for days and could have taken out a whole bunch of folks. So as President Robinson said, we must take these things very seriously. But we also must acknowledge the uh, social ills that are taking place. Uh, certainly COVID has, has, has been documented as causing an increase in mental illness and stress for people. And what we're seeing now is people just, it, it, they're, they're just feeling the need that this is how I express my anger. This is how I express my fear. This is how I, ex I express my delusion with life and society. And they've had enough models to emulate that some of them won't even have to plan. They just go and emulate those models. So I think it's a combination of the historical along with the evolution of us as a society and the social ills that uh, perplex our society along with the permissions uh, that have been given within society that it's okay particularly to um, go after people of color. And I think the recent case with Ahmaud Arbery is the first indication, the first serious indication that society is perhaps maybe ready to do something about these things. And hopefully some of that will begin to um, at least cause thought in another direction than what we've historically experienced. President, President Frank, any, any additional comments? Yeah, or yeah. yeah. I'll, just, I'll just quickly share. Fortunately, we weren't uh, victim to uh, some of the uh, threats that were made at other institutions, but but I certainly echo the sentiments of my colleagues that you know this is a reflex um, pursuant to the uptick in support that we've seen nationally for HBCUs, um, and I think as everyone has so eloquently stated, this is not new. Um, this is historic, and the the, the roots of this kind of uh, behavior uh, go go far and they go deep. But again, fortunately, we were not made subject to uh, to, to any threats, and we're, uh, we're we're thankful for that. Wow, wow. you know, I, I think about Florida Memo uh, Florida Memorial University. You know, we've been around 142 years, and for and 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 I think about in that time, this university had to relocate three different times due to racial uh, unrest and violence. And so when you think about that level of disruption and, and still here we are today providing quality education to so many deserving students. And um, I, I just think it's, it one, it speaks to God's grace upon our institutions and the steadfastness uh, of so many who are a part of our institutions and uh, but you know what? I'm excited about the future of our universities and the impact, transformational impact we will continue to make. 
Uh, I've been informed that our time is winding down. Um, uh, but there, there is another question that I really want us to sort of touch on. And that, that relates to many of us when we think about our endowments, we think about fundraising, uh, and particularly uh, in many of our institutions, uh, uh, again, where we are so dependent on, on tuition and the changes that are taking place in the demographics of non-traditional students. So in other words, your traditional student uh, body is dwindling. And so you got to think differently. Uh, and this brings me to the question about uh, oftentimes uh, what roles uh, should our alums be playing, our students and so many others, our governing bodies play in helping us to continue to diversify the revenue streams uh, in our institutions and supporting our institutions uh, as opposed to uh, the constant denigration sometimes when, when they don't see a certain thing happening. And, and I think it's just about realizing it's, it's not as cut and dry uh, as we always think. But it, it, when, and particularly when we are out soliciting and building relationships with donors and what have you, how they monitor everything that we do and that impacts us. So I'm curious to hear, um, if you will, just some salient thoughts, uh, what we can do and how we should uh, get our alums to be much more supportive. And when you do give, that doesn't mean that now you should dictate what the university does and what the president should do in those institutions and, and what have you. But let's quickly talk about the important role we must all play collectively to continue to strengthen the giving uh, to our institutions, to build our endowments, to continue to make our universities strong, just like so many other universities uh, that have billions in their endowments. And, and how they didn't get there overnight, but you know what? It was their alums and so many others who gave uh, through legacy programs and what have you. Talk to us. Talk to the audience. I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. That, that was a, a mouthful and, uh, and, and a whole lot. But let me just say this. Um, you know, leading anything is, 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 whether it's a football team, basketball team, or whatever, requires the building of a culture and a following. Um, there will always be expectations that folks will have. There will always be um, certainly uh, applause and criticisms. Uh, that's, just, that's part of life. That's part of anything we engage in. I think part of what we have to do is to excite our base. I mean, it's like running for office in politics. Um, and, and, I, and I really like to, to compliment our brother Edward Waters who took a place that basically had no profile, no presence, and has now rallied that community around the university. And so the, the true, I think the true power of all you've spoken of, all the different people coming to the table, becoming interesting, it comes down to what is our value proposition. I think we've all talked about it, defining that value proposition, getting the story told, getting people excited about it, and getting them to join in as co-owners, not as somebody to give you something, but as co-owners of the journey so that they are in embracing the vision, they are in sync with the vision, and they're on board, be that government, be that alumni, be that private donors, it's our responsibility as leaders to engage and excite our base in the same way that a politician runs for office, exciting their base. That's where I think the, the, the real fluidness and the real opportunities are to really advance forward lie. Thank you, Brother Robinson. Oh, well, I, I don't have much to add other than the fact that we have to get folks to sort of take a religious you know, connection to these very special 
places and, and understand that, um, you know, there are always going to be challenges and you may have not had an ideal position, but if you went to one of these institutions that are out in the world doing good, then obviously these institutions have something to do with that, right? And, and you really need to understand how challenging that was and how many people work extremely hard to make that possible. So giving back ought to be second nature, right? We need to understand this. We need to fight the battle for funding at the state level, at the federal level, and private circles, but we have to take care of ourselves, right? We cannot expect other people to do it. Quick story, we got a graduate school. I was working for my Marietta at the time. I got a call from one of the senior vice presidents to tell me, well, Larry, you know, we have something in common. You know, I'm, I'm a nuclear scientist. He was a nuclear engineer and I thought that was the road he was gonna go down. He said, we are both graduates of Washington University. And I want you to know that Martin Marietta has an employee, you know, matching program. You need to sign up for that program as quickly as possible. The point is, is relentless, right? They don't care about what happened on the journey. They know that as a result of the journey, you got somewhere in life and they're going to ask you to give and they're going to ask you a thousand times to give. And we have to embrace that mm -hmm. and, and see these places, you know, as, you know, ours, right? We, we right. went to these places. We had these special connections to them. We have to give back in order to make them whole. Uh, President uh, Faison, any any uh, comments you want to make? Uh, regarding I, I don't that? have much else to add other than, you know, it, it's important for us to accentuate the positives. Uh, all of our institutions are doing tremendous work. And often we are our own worst enemies. Um, it's not to say that we don't address issues and concerns as they relate to our institutions, our organizations, all organizations. My father says, if there's people in it, it's got problems. But what we often do is, is unfortunately, we okay. go and tout all of the negatives or the problems that we might have. And it really, it's counterintuitive because the folks that uh, we know that we are out soliciting support from to help us to assuage many of the issues that exist on our campus, they read those things and then it, it impedes our ability to have the resources that we're all wanting and needing to move our institutions forward. So, you know, we have to learn to accentuate the positive, address those things, but make sure that we're addressing them in the right way, in the right forums, so that we're keepers of our institutions uh, when they're viewed externally. So uh, again, I think all of what has been shared here is, is, is just spot on with regard to our alums, our external stakeholders and constituencies really, really uh, rallying uh, with one voice uh, to provide the kind of, I hope to yield the kind of support that we all need and want for our institutions. Member presidents, brother presidents, let me say that I'm getting notice that our time is uh, expiring and uh, we have about two more minutes. And I just want to say thank you all so much for coming on and having a discussion. I certainly uh, hope and pray that our audience really um, are going to be able to walk away well-informed about some of the great things happening at our universities and most importantly, how we continue to uh, work collaboratively and together to elevate our institutions. Thank you guys for the, the hard work you're doing because I promise you trying to lead any organization um, and, and, and what we are dealing with and have dealt with over these past two years uh, it, it's, 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 it's just tremendous that you're still here when presidents and so many others walked away. Uh, we are literally leading and having to navigate in terrains where there are no guides. Uh, and, and honestly, you just have to rely on your wisdom, God's wisdom, and the support of each other to continue to move our universities forward. And so um, that being said, uh, I just want to say thank you all so much, and I'll turn it back over to uh, Professor uh, Noel. Thank you, President Hardrick, and thank you, President Robertson, President Faison, President Powell, uh, for this much-needed discussion. This is the way for HBCUs to control their narrative and to continue to discuss important topics as we did tonight. 
to our audience members, thank you so much for watching. If you have any questions, please send them to the Office of Public Affairs. And before we officially close, I would like to just share a quick announcement. And we did discuss funding and we did uh, discuss how much finances will benefit our universities to help upgrade our infrastructure and give students at our university a much better chance at success to compete in this world. Um, Florida Memorial University's Giving Day is February 3rd. I repeat, Florida Memorial University's Giving Day is February 3rd. So I encourage you to get ready and get excited to give to South Florida's only HBCU. So again, I would like to thank the presidents of the four HBCUs in the great state of Florida. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you for your passion for our youth. Thank you for the passion for the education of black and brown folks here in the state of Florida and around the world. Um, your leadership is very important for the future of our community. And to all of our faithful viewers, we appreciate you. And we encourage you once again to share this video with all of your friends and family because we are changing the world. And so again, welcome to the Lion's Den. May you have a wonderful evening. Until next time.